Hello everyone and welcome to another Titans Live webinar. We thank you for joining us and we look forward to your participation today. This is intended to be an interactive session and we encourage you to participate and ask questions. If you need to communicate with our moderators, please use the chat tool. Chat should be used to let us know if you are experiencing a technical issue like no sound or problems with the video or just have general feedback for our moderators or presenters. You can also submit questions to our presenters using the Q&A button. We will bring your questions to our presenters' attention at the first available opportunity. You can upvote other students' questions, which are of interest to you. And please note that we will try to bring as many questions as possible to our presenters' attention. However, in order to address as many questions as possible in the time we have allotted, our moderators may answer some questions via text directly within the Q&A tool. At this time, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to our hosts. And before we do that, I do want to introduce the chat moderators. I am Jason Nicholson, the Student Life and Leadership Coordinator for the Downtown and Midtown campuses. As we noted in the intro there, um, we are going to be using the Q&A tool for specific questions that you have for our hosts today. Um, but feel free to let us know in the chat if you're having any issues or if there's anything going on. Also moderating the chat with me. Marvin. I'm Garvey Wright. I am the uh, Student Life and Leadership Coordinator with the Tarpon Campus. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the chat. Hi, I'm Barbara Weaver. I'm the Student Life and Leadership Coordinator at the St. Petersburg Gibbs Campus. And we would like to thank Heather Holtzman, who's one of our fabulous librarians at the Clearwater Campus, for bringing our guest uh, speakers on here today. So Heather, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce them, I will see the rest of you in the chat. Sure. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so our guest presenters today um, joining us are Davis Burkett from Wilcox Nursery, who will be giving us several tips and tricks on home gardening. And also joining us is Mallory Foster from Wise Hands, who will be sharing information on raising and caring for chickens. So we'll go ahead and get started, Davis. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Davis, as has already been stated. Um, I'm the office manager at Wilcox, and, um, you know, uh, with everything uh, recently in the world coming to light, you know, it's really a great time to, um, if you haven't already started experimenting with home gardening, um, or if you already kind of have been, uh, now's a great time to, um, to really get into it. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of resources um, out there to, uh, to learn about and to, um, and to, uh, to uh, you know, just test out. It's kind of a fun little uh, thing, but at, at Wilcox, uh, one of our, um, you know, our big deal is that we're uh, a native plant nursery. So we look to try and reintroduce, sell, but try and reintroduce the plants that, um, you know, are indigenous um, endemic to the state and try and reintroduce them um, back into people's yards, into the wild, things like that, um, because they're really important. Um, and especially in um, a, a county like Pinellas that is, you know, fairly developed, you know, with respect to other counties in the state, um, you know, that section of yard that you have or, um, you know, plants on your patio, that's really important, um, you know, if you can look to the native plants to try and, um, you know, create habitat again, introduce um, some of the native wildlife that, you know, essentially has lost where it's, you know, where it was, where it was living. Um, so, um, you know, I, I go over a couple of key points just so that everyone's on the same page, um, what a native plant really is. Um, you know, it's defined as a plant that's been established uh, in a given area before European settlements, and that's specific to, you know, uh, North America. Um, so these are plants that you can take a look back that have grown, adapted to the specific ecosystems, climates that you will find them in um, and have, you know, develop this relationship with other types of wildlife, um, with different organisms um, to create a sustainable uh, ecosystem. So these are, um, these are ecosystems that don't require any sort of outside input to maintain themselves. And that's the big key word um, whenever we talk about native plants is sustainability. We want to introduce plants that can then sustain wildlife um, and you know, keep the chain going um, because as we, you know, develop more and more and we take the habitat away, then, you know, we start um, dealing with issues with, um, you know, feeding the wildlife, um, you know, different uh, systems of wildlife will start moving all around the place just so that they can find uh, an area where they can, you know, thrive and, and survive. Um, 
but you know, kind of fundamentally, these are the plants that are supposed to be here. Um, these are the plants that can thrive in you know the varying uh, conditions that we have. So if it's you know 90 degrees, 95 degrees, uh, you know, in the summer, these are plants that are going to be totally happy. They're not going to be you know clamming for water, um, and they're going to be blooming and beautiful and happy um, just because that's the way it's been for for so long. Um, you know, and again, the idea is sustainability. So these are ones that wildlife rely on. These are things that, um, these are things that are so ecologically important um, to maintain. Um, and, you know, so what we've done at the nursery, um, you know, for the last 15 years or so, um, what we've tried to do is make that our big selling point is, you know, you're not only creating um, beautiful gardens or maintaining um, you know, maintaining plants that make you feel good, um, but you're also introducing wildlife back. You're, you know, you're supporting butterflies and bees and birds, different types of mammals, things like that, um, you know, while you're doing that. So, um, you know, when we look at landscaping, which is, you know, another key part of our, uh, of the business, you know, we look at sense of place. Um, we want to encourage people to use plants that, you know, you may see growing together out in the wild because, as they've grown and adapted, you know, these are plants that are, um, you know, supposed to be grown together, essentially. Um, you know, we always talk about sustainability again. Um, and, you know, some people may say that, well, I only have this little space, you know, what much is that going to do? Well, it can do quite a bit. You know, if you really think about, uh, you know, if every single person had one little wildflower out on their patio, um, you know, in a, in a subdivision, you know, that can still add up to, to quite a bit. Um, so um, there's another uh, little uh, tidbit that we talk about, um, you know, because not everyone's so deeply enveloped in the native plants um, that they want to just go crazy and say, oh, okay, everything native, I don't want anything not native, um, you know, not that interested in, in like succulents or something like that. Well, we always incentivize, well, co-planting. If you have vegetable beds or herbs or um, fruit trees, other things that you want to introduce, pollinators so that you can, you know, that you can uh, get your fruits, that you can produce, um, you know, a, a good yield, then, you know, it's, it's another incentive to say, okay, well, native plants, you know, are the ones that are going to bring in the pollinators so that I can get, you know, a, a good amount of fruit off my tree or, um, you know, a couple different bushes or trees are the ones that are going to provide habitat for um, different types of birds uh, that are going to naturally come over and pick the little worms off my uh, off my squash or or what have you. Um, so really, the idea is just plant what used to be here because that's what will sustain the things um, that can help you in your garden, but also that can help the environment. Um, and you know, going back, you know, taking a step back from the whole idea of native plants and what we're trying to do with, you know, the, um, with the environment, you know, Florida was called Florida for a reason. La Florida literally means the flowers. Um, so when we look at the diversity of plants that we have, you know, in Pinellas County, but also around the state, I mean, it's, it's staggering the number of species and the diversity that we have. Um, and, you know, to boot, the diversity that's available to, you know, the typical homeowner or consumer, um, it's a lot, you know, there are a lot of different variations of color and texture, um, different kinds of um, flowers that'll go during certain parts of the year. And, you know, there's a good amount of these that if you don't have the space to commit in, you know, in a yard or anything like that, there's a good number of them that can be grown in pots, you know, container gardening. And that's a big thing. You know, you can see behind me, I have a whole bunch of them because I live in an apartment and I don't have that um, luxury, but even still, you know, it's, it's things that, uh, that you can incorporate. Um, so and I, I think. Add a little um, note as well. Mm -hmm. um, from a maintenance perspective, um, Wise Hands is a small maintenance company that specializes specializes in native plants. Uh, we've noticed that with planting native plants, you really at a certain point reach an equilibrium where everything's kind of happy in the yard together. But a lot of times when you're planting more exotic plants, plants from other places, it's always a, 
um, um, who can take over more space. It's constant maintenance of pulling things out, putting new things in, wrangling those really aggressive plants. So that's another thing, you know, on your why native Davis, I would add is, um, you know, having a point where you reach that equilibrium and you have less work for yourself in your garden. Mm -hmm. And when I was just thinking less work and cost in general, right? If it's, if it's evolved to grow here, then it's not going to require as much irrigation and fertilizer and all the other stuff. So the, the cost and time that you spend is, is saved. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's again, one of the, one of the big, um, you know, uh, selling points, but also, you know, that's, that's the basis of it is that if you're introducing the plants that have grown, you know, specifically, you know, we sell a lot of Pinellas County natives. So these are ones that are very, you know, closely um, adapted to our area. You know, they've grown in nursery pots and they're grown in a setting where they do get irrigation very quickly so that they can be produced and sold. So there is a little bit of a, a window where, yes, you will have to plant it, you'll have to water it, care for it until then it can start setting its roots in the native soil um, or just growing out into a pot that um, then after that, you know, we essentially say, well, you know, don't really do anything to it. Now, you can always jump in um, and say, well, you know, I want to trim this and that, try and neaten it up, make things look better, um, or, you know, deadhead some of my flowers to try and produce more so it can keep blooming. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it's, it's a kind of plant it, um, let it get established and, you know, just let it, let it do its thing. That, that question, the, the chat's kind of starting to dig in on this a little bit. And Vera had asked, you know, is there a resource somewhere where she can know and identify like what her plants are that are growing in the yard now, how, how much water they might need? Where can she find like, you know, like a, almost a field guide to what's going on in the yard right now? Sure. Um, and you may so, get there. We don't want to side. Oh, you know. no, 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 no. This is perfect. Um, so, I mean, obviously Wilcox Nursery is a, um, is a, is a resource, you know, we typically will tell customers, you know, if you're not, a, you know, not able to bring things into us to actually, you know, talk to us about it, you know, like right now, um, you know, we usually say, well, if you take pictures, send us emails, we're usually very responsive on that. Um, you know, we kind of pride ourselves on having a lot of that information. Um, but there's also companies like Wise Hands and they do consultations. Um, and, you know, they're very, they're obviously very knowledgeable as well. And, you know, they do, um, you know, sort of yard walks and they'll talk about what plants you have and, and give you the kind of full rundown. Um, yeah. Yeah, we do. And then another free resource is the Pinellas County Extension. I'm going to just paste in the chat um, their um, garden help desk if you want to email pictures into them for free. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's a great resource too. Um, there's a lot of books out there too, and you could probably, I guess, maybe find them through the extension service. Um, different types of, you know, they talk about different topics, but, you know, common landscape plants, um, weeds, if you're trying to, you know, discern what's good and what's not. Um, that's a great free resource as well. Um, so I think as of now, uh, Mallory, if uh, I can turn it back over to you, uh, if you wanted to talk about, uh, talk about your, uh, the chickens. Yeah, sure. So Wise Hands, um, we, we have done a little bit of chicken consulting so far, but most of my experience with uh, holding, uh, ho having chickens is just having them in my backyard um, for, for chicken eggs. I haven't raised them for meat yet. So I'm mostly gonna be talking about, you know, having chickens for egg production. Um, and you can just go ahead and go to the next slide. That's our website, thewisehands.com, if anyone's interested in checking that out. Um, so today I'd like to just go over the basics of keeping backyard chickens. Um, one of the first things that maybe you wonder or think about is how many chickens should I get? And um, chickens are flock creatures, so you want to get at least two. Uh, one chicken would be rather lonely by herself. So you want to get at least two chickens. Um, and if you are having them for egg production, um, you'll want to think about how many eggs you'd like to have. So chickens produce eggs every one to two days. So if you have, say, two people in your family and you want two eggs a day, you might go for two or three chickens and you'll end up with the right number of eggs. 
if you would like more chickens, you know, you want to share with your neighbor or your friends, maybe go for four or five chickens. Um, you do need to have about three to four cubic feet per chicken. Um, so that will also influence how you want to build your chicken coop. You'll also want to check um, your city ordinances. Um, you know, in Pinellas County, we have uh, I think 24 or 25 cities and they each have a little bit different rules about how many chickens you can have. Uh, I believe in St. Pete you can have 10 chickens um, and some other places you can have more. Most cities restrict having just hens, like you can't have a rooster because of the noise that they make. Um, you can check by googling Municode, M-U-N-I-C-O-D-E, and your city name. And then if you search through a city code um, by using fowl or chickens as your search um, words, you can find out what your city um, allows. All right, you'll also want to think about what breeds to get. Um, different breeds of chickens have different qualities. Some are really friendly and nice and good with kids, and some are better egg producers, and some are better for raising for meat. Um, from my experience, for urban chickens, the friendliest breeds are Silkies and Buff Orpingtons. Um, they're really friendly. They don't mind being picked up. They don't really peck you. Um, they're a friend to all the other chickens. Um, and the Silkies as well will not, if you decide to free range your chickens and let them out into your yard or garden, they won't dig up your plants as much. Whereas a lot of other chickens pretty much, and all the other chickens that I've had before, they will dig up your plants because they want to get down into that soil and, and get all the, the bugs and worms. Um, interestingly enough, different breeds lay different colored eggs. Have you guys ever seen um, blue eggs or spotted eggs or light brown eggs? So if you look at this picture on the bottom of the silky chicken and the top one is the buff Orpington, you can see it has that blue ear. And the color of the chicken's ear is an indication of what color eggs she'll lay. So this silky will lay blue eggs or greenish eggs. Um, this buff Orbington will lay light brown eggs. And um, so that's just an interesting fact about them. All right, so chicken health. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. Most chickens are pretty healthy, especially if they're younger. Um, and you'll just want to make sure that you get your chickens from a reliable source. Um, they are supposed to be vaccinated when they're young. So if you get them from a hatchery that vaccinates, you'll be in, in better shape starting out. Um, you can start off by getting chicks. You can start off by getting pullets, which are like teenager chickens, or a full-grown hen. It takes about six months for chickens to start laying eggs. Um, and it is, in my experience, very difficult to introduce new chickens to your flock. So I would recommend starting out by getting the amount of chickens that you ultimately want, or maybe one or two extra, just in case you have problems. Um, you you want to look at their feathers every once in a while and look for mites. Um, this can be treated with something called diatomaceous earth, which is a natural substance. It's made out of, I believe it's made out of crushed um, crustaceans. And that helps um, that, that um, diatomaceous earth will get rid of mites. And you also want to have them, let them have a place where they can dust bathe. They actually make a little home in the, in the sand and, and, and get themselves all dirty, fluffing the, the sand around them. And this is really good for their skin. Um, I also recommend finding a veterinarian who sees chickens um, and having that phone number ready in advance if you do have any problems because it's very stressful when your chicken is sick and you don't know who to call. So just have that number ready in advance. And if you have noticed that your hen hasn't laid an egg in a while and she's usually a reliable layer, especially if she's acting malaise, um, she might be having problems. So that's a good way of keeping tabs on your chicken's health. Let me just check back into the chat if we have any questions. So hey, um, Mallory, we do actually have a couple questions that are in the um, Q&A section. And um, one of them is, uh, do you need a rooster in order for your chickens to lay eggs? Is that something that's necessary? And then um, Carla also wanted to know, 
if chickens are noisy, will they bother neighbors? And if, again, if you need a rooster. So everyone's kind of questioning whether yeah. or not you need that rooster. <laughs> so you don't need a rooster. Some people claim that your chickens will lay better and more frequently if you have a rooster, but you don't need to have a rooster. And um, your chickens will keep laying just fine without having a rooster around. Um, are chickens noisy? They can be rather noisy. Um, some ordinances have um, rules about how far your chicken coop needs to be from your neighbor's fence. Um, and this is because they do cluck throughout the day. They, you know, only the roosters will crow, so they won't make that really loud sound. But um, even the hens, they make clucking, and especially when they're laying, they'll make a lot of clucking. So it might be a good idea to check with your neighbors about, you know, whether they'd be okay with you having chickens, especially if you have a smaller yard. Uh, it's always a good um, perk to say, hey, I'm thinking about getting chickens. Uh, I'd love to share the eggs with you if you're okay with it. So, yeah. Well, for context there, my neighbor has, I think he has five chickens over there. And I mean, it's maybe 50, you know, 50 feet from my backyard and, and I rarely hear them. And, you know, the really? side benefit is every once in a while, he brings me over like a half a dozen eggs. So, you know, trade off. Another option if you're concerned about noise is quail. This is an area, I haven't had quail before, but I would love to try quail because they're much quieter than chickens. All right, and if you could go on to the next slide, Davis, please. All right, so this part is about housing. So I know this is something that I wondered a lot about before I got chickens, which is how do I build a good coop? I definitely built some that I scrapped after a while because they weren't so good. I really prefer a coop that's large enough for me to walk into. Because if I need to go in and clean their coop or refresh their water or, you know, Hopefully not, but if there's a chicken that's not feeling well, I need to go in and take care of it. Um, I've had chicken coops that are really small before, and it's just unpleasant to have to crawl into it. So that's a preference that I've noticed over the years. The main purpose of your coop is protecting your chickens. Even in an urban area, there are a lot of different animals out there that want to eat your chickens. <laughs> Even possums, raccoons, um, in Gulfport where I live, we've seen coyotes. So um, you wanna protect your chickens. And just like in this picture, you want to use hardware cloth. That's the square quarter inch um, mesh that you see in the picture. Um, you can just get it at you know any hardware store usually. Chicken, um, the mesh that's, you know, the octagonal chicken wire is actually not that good for chickens. <laughs> Um, you will also want to make sure that, um, that, the, that the hardware cloth goes below ground because some animals can dig underneath your coop. So put it down, you know, six inches to a foot below ground. And you also want to make sure that there's nesting boxes for them to go in and lay their eggs and perches for them to sleep on. Um, some chicken coop designs have a run, which is basically an area for them to go outside, like you see in this picture. And again, you want to check your ordinances because some of them have rules about how big the chicken coop has to be for the number of chickens or the maximum size that it can be um, in your city. And you can go on to the next one. So this is the last thing I wanted to talk about today on chicken basics was just food and water. Um, just make sure you get the right type of feed for their life stage. Chick food is different than laying head food. Um, it's okay to give them a little bit of food scraps. They love bread, pasta, um, cooked vegetables, fruit. They love watermelon, papaya, all kinds of things like that. Um, it's okay to give them, and it's actually healthy for them to give them weeds out of your yard. They know what to eat and what not to eat, but for example, if you guys are familiar with Bidens, it's like a small native flower. It's a little white flower. It's also called beggar ticks. They have those seeds that stick to your socks all the time. That is a very nutritious um, food for chickens, and I really love that, that plant. Um, if you're really into your chickens and you want to just spoil them, 
then you can build them a black soldier fly larva farm. <laughs> and I linked a video. Um, this is a, it's a little worm and it's a, it's the larva of a black soldier fly and um, they eat compost and the chickens absolutely love them. It's a really good source of protein for them. And then it's very important, especially in the summer, for chickens to have fresh potable water. And this is something that with my chickens, I check every day because they can die within a number of hours if they don't have enough fresh water. They actually drink quite a lot of water. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to go over. Any more chicken questions? Well, actually there are, and this is a good one because it deals with the production aspect because people want eggs, right? So we have um, Tanya and both Lee touched on it. And Tanya asked how long till they lay eggs? And then the question from Lee ties in with that because she thought, is it perhaps around two years? It's only about six months. So it doesn't take so long for them to lay. I think it might depend on the breed, but definitely before one year they should be laying. And then how long do they generally, what's the, the egg laying lifespan of a chicken? How long will they generally lay for? So this is really um, variable. What I've read on, you know, the different resources online is usually three or four years, but I've had several friends that have had chickens and their chickens were six years old, nine years old, still laying. Sometimes they'll stop laying for a while and then they'll start again. So I think it's a, it's a number of different variables, their breed, the types of food that you feed them, um, the individual chicken, but they can live quite a long time. There's one more question in here. Um, I know some folks will buy crickets to feed to some other animals. Are crickets something that they can have as well? Yes. Yeah. yeah, they eat all kinds of bugs. I've seen them eat, um, you know, they'll dig and find roaches and eat them. They'll eat crickets, they'll eat worms. They eat a lot of different things. Awesome. Well, um, it looks like for the moment, that's all the questions we have in regards to chickens. So thank you so much for presenting on that topic. And if there's any other questions that come up, we'll let you know. I'd also just like to add, if you are doing um, gardening, it's a, it's a great um, partnership with chickens because all those weeds that you pull, you now have a place that they can uh, go to be useful. So even things you might not want to put in your compost pile because of seeds or whatever the case may be, a lot of times your chickens will eat that. So it's a great recycling organism in your household. And Davis, as we, uh, we did have a few follow-up questions on sort of the native discussion, because I think, uh, and I'm not totally sure, but I think you might be going somewhere else after this. Um, yeah. the the first was, what's sort of the, the best places? I mean, where can you find like actual native wildflower seeds rather than just, you know, you get the garden store and it says wildflowers, but how do you know it's a, a Florida native? Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is, when you start kind of getting into the weeds about native plants, um, you know, uh, population is a word that comes up because we do have several species that occur in different parts of the state that have adapted um, you know, uniquely. So we would just call them separate populations of different native plants, you know, that might occur in North versus South Florida or East versus West Coast. Um, but, you know, typically, um, and we do carry um, seed stock from, um, from this co-op as well, but the, um, the Florida Wildflower Foundation is a great resource because they're harvesting responsibly too, because there's a lot of legal issue um, with native plants since a lot of them, um, you know, might be um, either endangered or threatened. Um, but they're usually um, really good about harvesting, you know, Florida populations of wildflower seeds, um, you know, and, and things like that. Um, for the most part, that's pretty much what you're going to find are wildflowers. You're not really going to find seed for, you know, shrubs or trees or anything like that. It's just kind of not really that much in demand. Um, but usually somewhere like that, the, the, the Wildflower Foundation is a great place to get um, responsibly sourced, but also um, accurate Florida, um, Florida populations of those native plants. Because, you know, Florida does share native species with other, you know, surrounding states. Um, so you do have to be careful because those, like, those populations or those ecotypes can, can differ in how they would do 
um, in Florida as opposed to Georgia or, um, or you know, Texas or something like that. Makes sense. Um, and then one other question that kind of relates to the natives, I, you may not feel free to, to kind of jump in and say, I don't really know. But I was curious too, Anna was asking, have you heard anything about repopulating fireflies to Florida? She said she read something a couple of years back about a UF professor trying to breed them to sell, but couldn't find anything online about it. And, and it's funny because recently, you know, I've spent a lot of time in like mountain areas where there's fireflies and stuff. And recently I feel like when I've been out hiking, I'm, I'm seeing them around here. Maybe I'm going crazy. Um, yeah. But, but I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm seeing fireflies. Do you, have you heard anything about it? Know anything about it? I haven't. Um, it's certainly something I'd make a note of and, um, and, and look into myself. Cause you know, that is something that, you know, as, as you know, there's less and less, um, you know, uh, habitat for different insects or just wildlife in general, um, you know, some, some organizations kind of have to step in and say, well, is there anything we can do um, to repopulate, to encourage, um, you know, different insects or wildlife to come back? Um, or, you know, even um, people are looking at it from a pest control standpoint where there are, you know, invasive plants that we have in Florida where they're, they're, you know, developing or breeding certain types of insects to eat them um, so that we don't have to be spraying chemicals and stuff like that. But as far as fireflies, no, I, I actually haven't heard about that. Well, thanks. Um, again, so they are actually getting a lot in the chat now that I'm not crazy. A lot of people have been seeing them more lately. Um, so mm -hmm. feel free to continue. I think um, there's a few questions in here about container gardening, but I think you're headed there. So I'm going to hold them um, and we'll let you kind of pick back up where you were. Thanks. Sure. Um, so I'm going to try and fast forward through this presentation here. Um, I mentioned La Florida um, and I I'm not going to go too in depth about each of these different species, I think I'm just going to kind of put them up there as a slideshow. Um, but, you know, wildflowers are one of the native plants that are very easy to, to grow in containers because generally, for the most part, you don't have to worry about like, okay, how big is this thing going to get? Is it going to continually outgrow every single pot I put it in? Am I going to have to have these big giant pots on a patio? Um, wildflowers are usually a pretty good choice. Um, and we've got a range of them that, that will grow in like full sun uh, environments, shadier environments, depending on, you know, what, um, what space you have. Um, so I would say those are the two biggest things. The two big key things is know the plant, know, you know, its limitations, how big it's going to get, how much space you need to offer it. Um, how much water it's going to need in a pot, um, and then also what kind of um, what kind of conditions you have um, to grow things in pots. So um, my patio out here um, is east facing, but we have a lot of oak trees, um, and it's also screened in, so it gets I mean like extremely filtered sunlight. Um, but it is enough that I can grow some part sun plants in there, some wildflowers that do um, well in you know shadier environments or, or less um, direct sun. Um, tick seed is one that I'll mention by name because um, Coreopsis, the species is our, um, or the genus, I'm sorry, is um, those are our um, state wildflowers. So those are ones that we like to promote in the nursery. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're just great all around. You know, we do have species that stay small. We have ones that grow larger, um, ones that'll tolerate more shade um, and ones that want more sun. So there's kind of a, there's kind of your pick for, uh, you know, growing our, 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 uh, our state wildflower um, in containers. Um, you know, we have stuff like Stokes Aster, which is a fantastic one for a lower light environment, it has these great big purple flowers that are really intricate. Um, things like Tropical Sage, which you can grow pretty much anywhere. They'll grow in full sun, they'll grow in a really shady spot. They bloom like crazy. Um, you know, the, the kind of, the world is yours really with, with native plants, um, specifically the wildflowers, because there's just so much diversity. Um, and even if you're picking from, from species that maybe don't grow, you know, quite in your area, you can usually kind of push the envelope a little bit. Um, you know, we've brought up um, certain species from South Florida and even some down from North Florida um, to try and grow them out with, you know, very levels of successes. But, you know, if you just get out there and start searching for Florida native wildflowers, there's really a lot that you can do. Um, so um, specifically for my area, you know, I have 
that really filtered sunlight. Um, what I'm growing typically is a lot of low light plants. So I have things like hammock twin flower, which traditionally, or like in a landscape setting, we would use as a ground cover um, because it does, uh, you know, grow by underground, um, underground roots, it'll spread. Um, but I've got that in a little tiny pot here um, as a wildflower because I know that it can handle that low amount of sunlight. And it makes, you know, a nice filtered, um, you know, kind of uh, stringy, uh, plants got a cute little purple flower on it. Um, but because I don't have a lot of light, a lot of what I'm growing, um, you could look at um, peperomias, which are really big um, for low light plants. And they're a native, they grow in like hammocky type areas, um, very shaded, very wet. Um, but um, some people call it a baby rubber plant. And uh, it's actually, it's that one right up there. It's in a massive pot and it took a while to get inside. So I'm not gonna try and bring it down here. Um, but um, when you're when you're gardening, it is it, you know stick to those two key principles. Um, there are a few herbs uh, that I'm growing out there as well that requ don't require as much sunlight. I've tried some that do like a lot of sunlight to see if maybe they'll adapt um, and live out there, but they, they kind of uh, kick the bucket. Unfortunately, things like dill um, and parsley are, are not things that that I can grow. Unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's all kind of an experimentation thing. You really want to get out there, um, do some research, try and figure out where like your baseline level is and then start experimenting, you know, maybe push the envelope with, okay, well, maybe this, this wants more sun, this plant wants more sun, but maybe my environment is good enough that it'll grow and then I could keep it alive until it, um, you know, adapts, um, you know, to maybe a lower light scenario than it's used to. Um, things like that. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to, to get into more specifics um, about these, whether or not it's native plants or vegetables or herbs. Um, and I know Mallory um, has, is definitely a, a good authority on, on vegetable gardening um, in general, um, especially if you have a piece of land to, to plant in. So so we, we do have several, actually. I want to start just because you were showing the sort of house plants that you have there behind you that you're you know keeping in the house. Um, Anna noted a few problems that she's having. So she said she's got a small, you know, the, the money tree plants um, and the leaves are getting these small like dark marks on them, almost like burn marks. And it's next to a north facing window. She's wondering if she should change location or if it might be something else. And then she also um, was noting that she has some lucky bamboo um, and it's sort of the leaves are curling and, and there's some discoloration um, going on in so a few places. And just curious if you had any any tips on what might be going on. Um, well, for the money tree, uh, very well could be, yeah, it, could, it very well could be sunburn. Um, typically, uh, when you have those really dry areas of, you know, edges of leaves um, is a good indication of either um, too much sun or, you know, it could be a water problem, but most likely not. Um, so I would, I would check on um, possibly that. Um, as far as, um, as far as the other one, the lucky bamboo, um, it's, it's difficult because there, there are so many different kinds of pests or um, that could cause curling um, deficiencies that could also cause yellowing or things like that. Um, that it kind of is on a, you know, examination basis. You'd really have to look at it and there's, you know, subtle signs that can, you know, differentiate certain pests or diseases or, um, you know, malnutritions um, in plants. So it, for the most part, it'd be something I'd say, well, maybe you can email us a picture um, um, so that we could take a look at it. Um, I will say that one thing that you could do is if you have leaves curling over themselves, kind of, you know, kind of like a claw underneath, um, sometimes certain types of pests like uh, aphids or uh, spider mites, thrips, things like that um, are all sucking type insects. So what they'll do is they'll latch themselves onto typically the underside of the leaf because it's, it's more protected than just sitting on top. Um, and they'll just, you know, insert their, their uh, device and, and start sucking. And that essentially causes those uh, leaves to curl over. So um, it could be that. And I would say, we'll check under, see if you could flip a leaf over. And if there is some kind of pest, um, something small or moving around, then that could be an issue. Otherwise, um, it could be uh, a nutrient deficiency um, or some other kind of, um, 
and some other kind of pests. And you can also look at the roots too, because sometimes um, sometimes certain types of pests are um, are root eaters, and you'll need to look for that in the soil. Okay, I'll good point. Also, just make a quick note that sometimes growing plants indoors is even more difficult than outdoors. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of people start off gardening with a house plant and when it doesn't do well, they kind of give up. They think they have a black thumb. They just, you know, get discouraged. But um, if you do have the space outside a balcony or a yard or a community garden nearby, give planting outside a try because when a plant is inside, you control the water, you control the light, and it's actually really hard to do that to the degree that the plant wants it. So plants, you know, they come from outside, they're used to having real sun and having rainwater. And I, in my opinion, it's just much easier to grow things outside than inside. Yeah, definitely. So we have a, we have a few. So and, and to keep this kind of making sense, what I'm gonna propose to my colleagues is, I'm gonna address these few, we'll go from inside the house to the, the patio. So I'm gonna address the few that sort of deal with lanai's and screen porches. Um, then I'll ask Barbara if she could take those two that sort of deal with potted plants because they seem like we're moving outside a little bit. And then Garvier, if you could jump in on that one with the lawns. So that way we kind of have a logical order to, to run through these real quick. Um, so we'll go from indoor to the lanai, and then we really have two questions there. The first is, is kind of related to the pest thing we have going on right now, or questions. Um, Anjum knows she has some plants on her screen porch, and they're getting sort of some black spots and almost white cobweb-like substance on the leaves. Um, any ideas on how to address it? Is she dealing with a pest or a, a fungus? Do we have any idea what that might be? Um, yeah, so there's a very common um, kind of string of, of, of pests that, that happen a lot, uh, you know, in, in landscape plants or on patios or even um, what we call sooty mold. And it's, it's essentially just a mold that grows and accumulates on plants that have an excess of what we call honeydew. And that's just sort of a, an excrement of certain insects. It's a very sweet substance um, and it's kind of a, a great breeding ground for this mold. So if it's kind of black and feathery and it comes off, um, you know, if you were to touch it, um, that's sooty mold. And typically that doesn't, um, you know, that doesn't harm plants quite as much. There, there is an extent to where like if every single leaf is covered with this black, you know, sooty mold, um, it does um, reduce the amount of sunlight the plants can take in, then you start having problems with photosynthesis and, and that can shut a plant down. But typically, um, you know, plants will still do okay with that. Um, and, and one of the causes is, is essentially lack of airflow or excess moisture. Um, and they kind of run in the same vein um, because that honeydew doesn't get washed off or swept off by wind or things like that. Um, it kind of just allows the mold to come in. Um, so essentially that mold is not you know, the problem in itself, um, but that mold then can um, sort of signal to different types of insects that the plant is vulnerable. And then that's kind of the key that lets in things like um, the aphids, um, scale is a really bad um, pest that will happen on plants, um, thrips, white fly, um, muley bug. Um, so there's a lot of things and a number of them can cause that white spinny web. Um, but again, you know, there are very, you know, there's sort of a, a string of pests that can do that, but there's also, you know, variation, very subtle variations. So, you know, uh, again, pictures would, would really help diagnose, um, diagnose the issue. And, and that's a big, that's a big deal when we're talking about um, pests and how to control them is you really need to understand what pest you're dealing with, because, you know, even if both pests can kind of run in the same vein, um, and they're very similar, there could be completely different methods of control. Um, you know, we have hard-bodied and soft-bodied scale that you could treat in different ways simply because one has a hard outer casing um, on it as it's feeding and the other one doesn't. Um, so then it, then it sounds like good general advice on sort of the pest discussion would be um, sort of taking advantage of your local garden shops, the, the mm -hmm. IFAS folks at the extension, using that, e the sending your pictures in, um, because you really want to get the expert in to help target what it is. Yeah. And then they can also, you know, then recommend um, effective mes methods of treatment and okay. so forth. We do have sort of one more patio question, and then again, I'll let um, Barbara get to these sort of outdoor pot questions. Um, mm -hmm. The 
the Lanai area, you know, we've talked about pests and, and things like that. The Lanai or screen porch area is sort of protected naturally, right? You've got a screen there. Um, uh, there was a question here about herbs. Um, what sort of herbs are good to grow? Because it is sort of partially shaded, right? You're not always getting full sun. Right. So what sort of herbs would thrive in that sort of screen room area? Well, what I've got out there and I've done historically well with is um, I have sage growing very well. Um, actually, I would say maybe not very well. It's still, it's still growing and still putting out leaves. I don't think quite as fast as I think sage should. Um, rosemary is doing surprisingly well. I think it is a slow grower, so it has a little bit more time uh, to adjust um, to its environment. So I do have rosemary growing fairly well. Um, I also have lemon balm is a fantastic plant for a shadier area. Um, that one really, really, really does well. Um, I do have um, a native wild onion that you'll find all over the state and pretty much all the way up the East Coast um, that does well in that, that partial um, sun area. Um, I've also got um, a native species of basil that's got big wide leaves that you know can tolerate a little bit more shade. Um, and those are some of the ones that I played around with, um, you know, and, and that have done, you know, okay, I think for the most part, um, the native stuff that I'm growing would still like more sun. Um, and I, I've just kind of played around with it and see if they would adapt to it. And they have. Um, and but you could also grow, um, you could also grow other things uh, like thyme. Thyme would do probably pretty okay. Um, oregano. Um, and I'm sure um, you could probably get like mints to grow, although mints are certainly very aggressive plants and you'd want to make sure that um, they're not near anything. Otherwise, they, you, you run the risk of your mints eating everything. I would also add if you're gardening on your lanai and it's screened in, you really spot check your plants before you bring them in. Uh, and this is because if your area is screened in, then you're... Um, predatory insects like the ladybugs and wasps that would come in and kind of nip a problem in the bud like aphids can't get in. So what could happen is if you do have aphids or something on a new plant that you're bringing in, um, it can just kind of get really bad really quickly. So just look over your plants before you bring them into your lanai if it's screened in. Um, make sure there's no aphids, uh, white flies is another one. Um, so that you're not bringing those bad things into your enclosed environment. Yeah, I actually had a, a, a quick story on that exact note as I brought um, one of our native wildflowers called Columbine. It's a biennial, so it'll, uh, it'll take two years to grow and then flower and then it'll die off. Um, but I brought it back from the nursery and when we were growing it in our greenhouse, um, I'd seen that it had spider mites on it, which essentially looks kind of like, um, kind of like very small pale spottages all over the leaf um, and you know typically what you could expect to happen is is just remove the infected leaves you know dispose of them properly so they don't have a chance to you know uh, spread to other plants from wherever you're you know you're keeping your cuttings or whatever um, and then um, I kind of just expected it to tough out but it didn't uh, so I did have spider mites that spread to some of the other plants I have, like the twin flower and the Florida basil, it did spread. Um, so kind of just because I was a little negligent, um, I had to look to like neem oil um, and pyrethrins to, to, treat the, to treat the problem. But that's definitely important is inspecting your plants before you bring them into a very closed environment where there isn't that outside interaction to control them naturally. Um, we have quite a few more questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A section. One of the ones I think you may have kind of just covered, Davis, um, but maybe you want to elaborate just a little bit further. Ava wanted to know what are some good ways to minimize pests in the garden, um, especially with potted plants. Um, she hates the idea of using pesticides or chemicals that could harm helpful bugs or wildlife, but isn't sure what to do. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one of the, you know, the biggest things we do recommend because some people are weary of, of the chemical agents. Um, there are a few natural, um, you know, sort of non-chemical um, applicants that are, you know, extracts from plants or different um, biological solutions. Um, you know, different kinds of bacteria will deal with um, certain kinds of like caterpillars. Like we recommend BT. Um, it's a strain of bacillus that will, you know, get into the caterpillars and cause some problems and, and treat the issue. 
Um, so if that's something that you're willing to, to, to take on, you know, those are good recommendations. Um, otherwise, you know, identifying the problem, um, you know, making any sorts of um, mechanical solutions. So um, pruning infected leaves or, um, you know, if you have a problem in the soil, you know, you may have to take that plant out of the pot, assess the damage and um, maybe try and clean it out. Um, and then repot it into into fresh soil. Try and minimize the minimize the damage. Um, but there are some things you can do, and and there is a happy balance depending on what the pest or the problem is. Um, you know, uh, it's it's kind of all about that. Cool. Um, one other, or we have two other questions, real quick, just about kind of potted plants to continue on that path. Um, is there an area or a place that you guys would mind sharing the link in the chat if you're familiar of where? Um, these folks can find, you know, a list of native plants that will grow really well in pots. Do you have anything that, um, a resource that you could share? Um, I'm sure I could uh, not, I don't have any offhand. Um, I, you know, I do think probably the extension service is a great place to go. They may have some articles on that. Um, there are a few local um, uh, people in uh, Pinellas County that have blogs about native plants. Um, Craig Hugel is one of them that comes to mind. He's a, um, he's a professor, actually, I think a professor for SBC. Um, uh, but he has a, he has a blog that I will, uh, I'll dig up and, uh, and send it to the, to the chat. Um, but he does um, posts about a lot of our different native plants, um, specifically wildflowers. Um, and I'm sure that uh, during those, during those blog articles, he probably touches on that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think just just research is you know there's a lot of great um, there's a lot of great resources out there um, universities um, you know local uh, professors or or local entities you know that's that's something that I'm kind of shocked that we haven't really touched on or promoted on social media through Wilcox um, you know different types of potted plants um, I will say if any of the hip young kids are on Instagram um, or YouTube even uh, Wilcox we're on both of those. Um, and a lot of what we post are, you know, all of our plants and we give, you know, rundowns of what the plant likes. And a lot of times we will say, oh, well, this will also do fantastic as a potted plant. Um, so that could be a good resource to use too. One other quick question about pots. I mean, this one's a little bit more specific, but I have a feeling it might um, relate to some other things. Sarah wanted to know, she has a pink lemon tree, which sounds very interesting. Um, right now, she currently has it in a pot. When should it go in the ground? And maybe if you could elaborate too on, you know, I know a lot of folks may have some citrus, lemons, limes, things like that. Are those kind of all the same idea where they need to go into the ground at a specific time frame during the year? Um, I mean, yeah, for the most part, I would kind of, kind of lump them all together. Um, it's, it's spring is a fantastic time to get planting for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's, you're, it's kind of in that middle ground of like, okay, it's not super duper hot right now. Um, you know, you can kind of, uh, give the plant the best training wheels possible. So it's not super hot. Um, uh, you know, and you can control the watering, um, before the rainy season starts coming and get that thing established. Um, but one of the cautionary, um, things I will say is that, um, you know, citrus suffer, um, from a disease called uh, citrus greening. And it's, it's a really big deal. And what that is, is essentially it's a, it's a disease that restricts, um, it restricts a lot of things, but uh, nutrient intake, um, you know, will keep fruit from ripening on the tree, can cause problems with the leaves and photosynthesis, stuff like that. Um, and the way that it happens to these citrus trees is it's deposited by a weevil. Um, and essentially that weevil will come around, it'll lay its eggs in the ground and it starts at the root. So a lot of us at the nursery, we don't actually carry citrus anymore just because of that, um, just because of that issue. And what I will say is our kind of best method for growing citrus is keep it in a pot. So if you can afford to, um, as it outgrows the pots and gets bigger, um, perhaps just look at um, investing in, you know, just bigger pots, up potting it and keeping it there. Because if you're restricting the amount of soil that it's growing in and the amount of, um, I should say, open soil that's around it, you're sort of reducing um, the chances of um, that weevil finding it, um, you know, laying the eggs and then it possibly contracting the disease. From growing citrus, I think are fantastic and they do really really well here 
just something that you, you, you know, you need to think about is that, um, you know, can I afford a lot or do I really need to come? So that would be my recommendation. And just real quick while you're on citrus, um, somebody was noting their um, sort of grapefruit tree and they said they, they'd picked their last grapefruit in January. Um, the tree flowered afterwards, but you know, hasn't noticed any grapefruit starting to grow yet. Um, does it flower again? Is it dormant for like just a grapefruit tree life cycle real quick? Um, how many times will it fruit in a year? Yeah, I mean, so there is a lot of variability definitely between different um, different cultivars and different varieties of fruits um, that are, you know, that are bred for, you know, double blooms or triple, you know, uh, different fruiting cycles. And some of them start earlier, some of them start later. So there is, there is a little bit of variance here where, you know, it could be all dependent on, um, it could be all dependent on the different variety that you have, if it's an early or a late bloomer, um, whether or not it's going to yield, you know, more than once in a year. Um, you know, if your fruiting is starting in January, um, if you, or if you got your round of fruit in January and it's pushing out new blooms, um, it may not be likely that you get, um, you know, uh, even if, you know, you are getting the flowers, you may not, you know, be getting the fruit, um, uh, until, you know, the, the sort of cycle that you already have. Um, so you may not see more fruit until J uh, January, but it kind of all depends on, on, you know, the sort of bloom and fruit window of that specific variety, if it, if it, you know, if there is one, um, and sort of the conditions it's in. So if you're not seeing fruit now, I, I'd say you probably aren't going to get it until, um, until, uh, you know, January again. And just in the interest of your time, um, and the, you know, the sort of webinar time, I'm going to propose Garvey, do you want to jump in with that question on decorative native um, sort of grasses? And then we'll do a quick lightning round on vegetables where we'll just kind of ask you guys to, you know, just kind of run through them real quick because we are getting to a point where I'm, I'm thinking you may have to go or some folks may need to go. So um, Garvey, I want to jump in with that grass question. And Davis, I'm sure you've been asked this, but Kathleen and I, we definitely have to know what is a good native de decorative grass? For um, full Florida sun. Sure. Um, well, uh, one of the ones that we really like to promote at the nursery, and actually, it's fantastic because I have it right in my slide. It's called mealy grass. Um, it's it's a fairly wiry grass. Um, it gets to about three to four feet tall. Um, it's a really nice bunch grass. Very drought tolerant. Um, it's salt tolerant. So if you're by the wa uh, you know by the open water, it does really well there. Um, but uh, once a year, um, usually starting in the fall around October, um, they get this uh, plumage of pink flowers. And, you know, it's, it's very breathtaking. And the, the picture is a little saturated, usually a little bit darker than that. Um, but muley grass is one of the ones we really like to promote because it has a really spectacular um, show of color. Um, we also do have a few different types of foliage grasses um, that, you know, that you can grow less so for the flowers because, you know, they're a little, they're not, quite a spectacular, um, but have thick leaves. If you're looking for more of like a texture um, thing to go in your yard. Um, but um, kind of tying it back into container gardening, there are a number of different types of grasses that are, um, you know, smaller plants. We have black seeded needle grass. That's a little tiny wire grass that you, gr you could grow in a pot and it wouldn't outgrow it. Um, Elliot's love grass, I think I've got a picture right there. It's got a very bluish silvery foliage that's really nice and it you know can it only gets so big too um that could also be kept in a, in a pot if it's you know a little bit bigger um so yeah there's there's definitely uh, some variety in different types of grasses um those i would say are the most popular but there are some that grow smaller um and there's definitely a lot of variety out there too one more um, that jumped in related to grasses um, as you started talking about it. And then Garvier and Barbara, if you guys want to each grab one of those um, sort of edible questions to, to roll with after that. Um, but Anna asked, do you know anything about moss gardens and using moss as a ground cover or moss for a lawn instead of a grass? Um, you know, to go from the decorative grasses to the lawn discussion, I always joke that I zeroscape. You know, I don't, there's no, my, my grass is just whatever grows in my yard and gets mowed. <laughs> Um, so any thoughts on lawns, mosses, ground covers, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, um, and maybe uh, Mallory's got some insight too, but you know, if you're trying, if you're looking for the true mosses, you know, uh, you know, the, the wetland 
um, type plants that'll grow, uh, you know, grow where it's moist, typically on like rocks and in, in kind of shady areas like that. Um, it, I don't know about like a full scale lawn out of moss. Um, definitely if you're doing moss gardens, you know, on a smaller scale, it's, it's, it's very doable, um, you know, and, and moss is, is not something that we usually play with around the nursery. Um, but certainly I think in a smaller scale, it could be a lot more manageable, but on the larger scale, uh, might be a little bit of an undertaking. Yeah, I don't have much to add. They like a lot of moisture and to grow on rocks. I've seen some cool things online where people would paint uh, um, moss um, spores onto a rock wall that's shady, um, but yeah, just somewhere shady and moist would be the best place to, to try that. Um, and actually, Mallory, while you were just on here, let me ask you one more question. Um, we have had this question kind of sitting in the, the Q&A for a little bit, and it's back to your chickens. Um, Maria was wondering whether or not it's okay for chickens to be outside um, in the backyard under shade, especially in the heat with Florida. So what are your quick kind of recommendations on that? Yeah, the three things to keep in mind with summers in Florida are make sure they have water every day. They will especially drink a lot of water uh, when it's hot. If you can provide some shade to them, that really helps them. And then the third thing is some open ground. Because what they'll do is they'll dig themselves a little hole in the ground, only about, you know, six inches deep at the most, and they'll put their bodies in that cool uh, soil under, under the ground a little bit. So if you do those three things, they should be okay. And just awesome. a quick programming note before you go, Barbara, guys, we are... Um, respectfully, your time and our presenters' time, uh, we clearly feel the interest here, and I, I think we'll have a discussion about setting up maybe another Q&A um, in this area, maybe with Davis, but um, if we could hold the rest of the questions, we'll get through what we've got in there, um, and, and we'll see where we're at once we get through there, and, and if Davis has any more time, but we've gotten to a, we're really happy with the popularity here, but we want to get through what's in there, so go ahead, Barbara. Thank you, yes. Um, it's a lot of great questions, so thank you guys for being so interactive. And if you're able to stay, we'll try to get the rest of the questions in here answered really quickly. Um, so in regards, there's a couple of questions that are um, regarding like plants and vegetables. Um, one of them, and I'm sorry, it just kind of keeps skipping on me. Um, Carla indicated that she purchased creeping sage from Wilcox. Is that edible? Is that something you can eat? Um, so creeping sage, uh, salvia micella is, is, it's a member of the, of the sage family. So, you know, it will have the very fragrant leaves. Um, I don't know particularly if I would cook with it or, or eat it, uh, in general. Um, typically you want more cultivated varieties, um, you know, that, that have been kind of deemed safe for consumption. There are, um, a few native plants that we um, like to promote as, as edibles. Um, but even then, you know, out in the wild, plants will um, contain higher levels of certain, um, of certain compounds that, you know, may not be uh, completely safe for consumption uh, in, in large amounts. So uh, my, my answer would be probably not. I wouldn't eat it <laughs> without <laughs> consulting a 100% expert on that, um, of which I am, I'm, I'm probably about an 80%. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust it. Um, one more question on, um, so Kai says, um, that there's a bunch of, uh, vegetables and different things. Wow. It seems like a very extensive, uh, vegetable garden that you've got going on there, but the zucchini squash have caterpillars on them. Is there anything that you can recommend, um, specifically for caterpillars on vegetable gardens, things like that? Um, yeah. So kind of going back to what, um, I was talking about earlier, um, and one of the kind of cool stories is uh, we tell on our YouTube, we talked about a, a Southern red cedar, but um, it housed, uh, uh, I, think, I think we identified it as a warbler, but um, we had the Southern red cedars planted right next to a patch of, um, a patch of squash. And what it would do is it would go, we, we watched it sit in the foliage, stare at that plant for about 10 minutes, and then it would jump over, pick off all of the little cabbage worms that were inside the flowers, um, and then kind of hike back over to the tree and kind of repeat the process. Um, so, you know, if you have that luxury of having space to invite the wildlife, that's a great um, kind of natural pest solution. 
Um, otherwise, my go-to would be um, BT. Um, thuricide is, is what you'll probably find on the label. It's, um, it's a strain of bacillus, bacillus thuringiensis, and it's a, it's a bacterial um, it's a bacterial applicant that um, is specifically targeting um, these certain types of worms. And, you know, without getting too graphic, essentially it'll shut down some of the processes of the worm and, and uh, be a bacterial pest that's, you know, safe, you know, uh, to spray on your plants, still harvest the food. It's not going to affect it in any way. Um, so that, that would be my go-to uh, before, you know, looking at any other like chemical uh, solutions. Um, one other question um, Tanya had was that she um, has a pretty large vegetable garden and unfortunately sometimes I think they get stepped on. I'm not sure. It sounds like maybe it's humans and animals. Um, is that something that should be concerned about? Like, are they going to die? Is it just going to bruise them? Um, yeah, I mean, so depending on the type of plants that you, that you have in that garden, um, some might be, you know, extremely fragile that you really, you know, you really want to discourage any, uh, you know, foot traffic or anything like that, um, that potentially could damage um, either the, either the, um, you know, your, your harvest or the, the plant itself. Um, generally, I would say if you are vegetable gardening, for the most part, I would try to keep, you know, foot traffic to a minimum, um, try to keep things things out of it. So you don't have things running in there, damaging plants, um, affecting the production, um, things like that. But there are some pretty tough plants, you know, like seminal pumpkins are, are, are kind of squash that have great big leaves, really thick stems, and you can probably trample all over it. And it still produces great big, um, great big squash. But it, as a general rule, I'd say try and try and keep, uh, keep it to a minimum. And Garvey, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah keeping in mind that human element and creating a little path that's easy to see. I know this especially helps with kids and um, in the past I've worked in school gardens. So if you can make a visible path for the kids and teach them walking on the path, looking into the garden, uh, that, that helps a lot. And for real sensitive stuff, maybe raised beds, right? Keep some kind of up and- Yeah, definitely. Um, Garvey, if you want to take, I think that Blackberry question you've got noted in the front yard question kind of relate. So if you want to grab both of those, I'll then take the, the remaining sort of decoratives that we have there. Yeah, and that's a great one because the Blackberries, that's a great family interactive activity. And I remember that it with my family as well. So the question from Tanya is bringing on how fast do uh, Blackberries grow? And it's also how fast quickly do they spread? Uh, yeah, I mean, so typically, typically pretty fast. Um, blackberries are one of those plants that definitely could be grown um, in a shadier uh, environment. So like filtered light underneath a tree, they'll still grow and produce, you know, fairly, you know, fairly all right. Um, but typically pretty fast and they are a sprawling vining type plant. Um, so whether or not it's crawling on the ground or if it's got a trellis to grow up, um, you yeah, know, maybe generally about two feet, uh, two feet or more uh, a year, for sure. Um, you know, probably closer to three or four, um, depending on, you know, it's the amount of sunlight and things like that. Um, you know, and there's, there's spineless varieties as well, if you don't want to deal with, you know, pricking your thumb or your finger every time you're trying to pick fruit. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're fairly fast finding plants um, and typically produce pretty quickly as well. And I think um, the other vegetable sort of question, and, and also, you know, could be for the berries as well, um, front yard sort of gardening, and I, I imagine this sort of varies on municipality. Actually, all these questions strike me that my, my neighbor is like really into all these movements. He's got a front yard vegetable garden surrounded by wildflowers right behind, next to the fence where his chickens are held. Um, <laughs> but any, um, any tips on vegetable gardening in the front yard? Is it largely accepted, not accepted? Could you use vegetables as landscaping and get away with it? Any thoughts there? Yeah, um, it's actually pretty cool. Um, there are different ends of the spectrum. And it, if you are in a community, it, it probably relies heavily on what the HOA says. Um, uh, you know, my parents live up in Pasco in Newport Ritchie. And um, 
just as kind of a, a gauge of that, you know, they require a certain percentage of your yard to be lawn um, of your front yard because as they drive through, you want to have the green lawns and everything. Um, there are also some um, areas um, that aren't deed restricted that um, it's by municipality and that's another issue. Um, but uh, there is also, so there's kind of a, there's kind of a, a there's, a lot of variants, but uh, you know, you can go from a place like this that says, okay, your your house has to, your front yard has to be eighty percent lawn or seventy percent lawn, um, and you really can't get away with that. Um, but there's also places, even in still in Pasco, in Newport Ritchie, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Jim Kovaleski, and what he's done is, you know, he's in a he's in an area where he has complete control over what his yard looks like, and his entire front yard is um, just rows of vegetables and he vegetable gardens out of his front yard um, and takes them to farmers markets um, and different things like that um, where you could completely landscape your front yard with um, with vegetables or edibles things like that um, and and that is your landscape you're literally living in your own uh, in your own garden which is which is really cool so um, just going through and seeing what kind of restrictions you have on where you live and then kind of going from there and I would add also earlier, I believe last year, the Florida legislature passed um, a bill to not allow local um, municipalities, counties, and cities to restrict front yard vegetable gardening. So oh. I'll paste the, an article about that into the chat. Um, so that's kind of um, an interesting piece of legislation. Some some cities that had been working towards supporting um, veggie gardens and front yards um, were a little dismayed because the state went ahead and passed that legislature um, at, the, at the state level versus the local level. But I think a lot of people are happy about this move as well. But if you don't, then this probably applies to you. No, those are those good points. A lot of this is going to be really, really local. Um, and two questions that circle back to decoratives, and we really appreciate your time today. Um, one is very specific. Um, how do I plant a bottle palm tree in the corner of my backyard? And how big will a bottle palm tree get? Um, so one of the bigger, um, one of the big things about planting, you know, in the ground as opposed to a pot, um, well, even in a pot, is just make sure you don't plant these plants too deep. Um, typically, if it's container grown, um, you know, there's a top level of soil. Um, that's sort of your guide for how deep to plant it, is that you don't want the level of the soil from the pot to, um, to be deeper than the, the, um, the grade around it. Because what that does essentially, um, it will collect water towards the trunk. And for most things, unless they're aquatic or wetland type plants, don't tolerate that amount of moisture because then things can start to rot or mold. Um, and that will, you know, very quickly decline the health of the plant. Um, so usually we say plant it at level or higher, uh, maybe an inch or so. Um, and just make sure that you water it. Um, you know, it'll take time to get acclimated. Palms are usually pretty tough plants. Um, once they get into the ground and established. Um, but bottle palms can get, can get, I would say maybe like 20 ish feet. Um, they will grow extremely slow. Um, so it's not something you have to worry about taking over, um, you know, in the blink of an eye. Um, so, yeah. And for our last question here, we're going to do it Alex Trebek sort of video style. Um, somebody was asking about hibiscus plants in the chat, and I, I actually came outside because I'm having a similar problem. And I, I think this is going to be highly varied, right, based on each of everybody's situation. But it was just about flowering hibiscus and how to encourage flowers. I think these here in this front garden at the house, there's a tree that's grown up and they're just in the shade too much now. So I, I don't think they're getting enough sunlight to thrive. And I've thought about moving them. But in general with hibiscus, um, how often should you expect flowers in our sort of climate? Any fertilizer tips, any, any keeping them out of the shade like these guys here, what should we be doing with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, so you kind of touched on pretty much all the variables. Um, sunlight obviously is key. Um, you know, you, you, wanna, you wanna make sure that uh, these exotic plants, um, you know, that, that are, you know, heavy into flowering, you wanna make sure they get plenty of sunlight um, so that they can continue that, um, continue the cycle. 
Um, typically, um, as well, you know, Florida has very poor soils. Um, nutrients leach very readily out of them. So um, typically with exotic plants, plants that, you know, are not indigenous, um, you, you will have to look into fertilizing just to make sure that they're getting the right um, nutrients, uh, both macro and micronutrients. Um, the one plus that we do have is that typically Florida soils are pretty high in phosphorus. So that's kind of your, that's kind of your, um, your macronutrient that does influence, um, does influence blooms uh, pretty heavily. So it's something that, um, but it's still something that people have problems with, um, uh, even micronutrients, uh, you know, not being available. So that can, that can uh, affect the blooms. So typically uh, I would say, you know, obviously make sure it's got enough sun. If that's not the issue, you know, it still gets plenty of sunlight and it's not blooming. Um, I would look into fertilizing, um, you know, and that is a, a little bit of a, a, something I'll bring up is that uh, in Florida, uh, in, in, in um, Pinellas County, I should say, um, we do have fertilizer bans um, to keep us from fertilizing. Um, and I think it actually this past year just changed to any fertilizers containing uh, nitrogen or uh, nitrogen or phosphorus are um, not permitted during certain parts of the year, usually during like our rainy season, um, because then because those nutrients leach out so readily, they'll find their way into the waters. Um, then you have things like algae blooms and that can affect the, the wildlife in our waters and, and the water quality and things like that. So um, yeah, I would say fertilize maybe twice a year um, during the windows, usually like uh, late winter, or early spring. Um, before June 1st, which is, uh, which is when that uh, goes, that ban goes into effect. And then later on in the fall when the, when the ban is lifted. So if you are looking to fertilize the key, knock it out right now. Um, and you can keep yourself on, you know, keep the environment healthy first and foremost, but keep yourself on the right side of these uh, sort of county of ordinances. Law. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then last, so, you know, while we're on that hibiscus question, you know, just I'll take a personal moment here with those ones where they maybe they have you don't have them in pots, they're in a garden somewhere and they they have, you know, other plants have grown up and shaded them out. Is that something you can transplant? I mean, is there a point where the plant just becomes like if you're not seeing any leaves on it, just go ahead and rip that bad boy out? Or is there a point where you can still cut it down and move it? Yeah, I mean, uh, for the most part, um, you know, most of these plant and most of these perennials are things that you could probably move. Um, uh, hibiscus is certainly one that I think transplants pretty okay. Um, you know, uh, what you would want to do typically is give it a good cutback, you know, remove a lot of the, um, a lot of the foliage, a lot of the burden of, you know, energy producing that it will need and then dig it up and move it. And then, um, you know, since you're removing a lot of the weight of, you know, how much energy it needs to produce to keep growing, then um, you know it makes it easier to um, sustain the leaves uh, and start growing out its roots and um, and continue living. Um, the one thing that I would caution people of is that um, if you're going from two vastly different um, uh, conditions in a very quick amount, you know, very you know fast amount of time. So if you're going from you know you you had a tree that grew up over the years that is now pretty much completely shaded the hibiscus. If you take that out. Um, you know, it's been acclimated to it for a few years. If you take that, then move it into a full sun area, then you can start to see a lot of stress on the plant because it, you know, spent a lot of time adapting to a shadier environment and growing in that, that you're turning it, you know, you're moving it into a, a super bright light, maybe some more heat. Um, and that's something that it's not quite used to. Um, so you may see a uh, problem. So sometimes if it's not too big of a plant, um, I could even recommend digging it up, doing a cut back, moving it into kind of like a transition area where it's got a lot more sun than it did, um, but not quite full sun, and then leave it there for maybe a, a week or two, and then transitioning it into um, transitioning it into that full sun area just to give it kind of the best chance of um, transplant success. And Mallory, any other transplant sort of guidance there? I mean, I, I think what we're hearing is that you want it to be healthy before you move it, right? But anything else? Um, I totally agree with Davis and, and just a little clarification. I think you meant um, putting it in a pot. And then oh, I'm sorry. The, yes. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so I've noticed the same thing. Like if I put it from one place to another place, it's usually really difficult for it to survive. But if I put it in a pot, water it really well every day, transition it slowly, let it grow new roots, and then plant it in a new place and have a lot better success. 
Well, thank you guys. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I don't know if my other coordinators had any questions. Um, I know we've gone way over on time for both you guys and the audience, and it's it's greatly appreciated. I think you can feel the interest in, in what you guys are talking about here. The chat's kind of had a lot of thank yous, but any any last thoughts? I just wanted to say thank you as well. I think we've had a lot of really great questions, and we really appreciate your time today. I know it was very helpful for me, and I think everyone got a lot out of it. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's Thank amazing. You Thank you so time. much. Appreciate it. Wanted to share my thanks as well. It was amazing. Thank you for everything you touched on and also the participation it was great. That really made it. Yeah. And then one last plug while all the uh, audience is signing off here, we do have Name That Tune tonight. I'm actually going to go finish wrapping up the technical side of that now. Um, but feel free to join us. The link's right in Workplace and My Courses, right where you found the link to this. Um, with that, I'm done. If anybody else has any other thoughts. Thank you so much, Davis and Mallory. Thank you. This was, this was super fun. All right. Well, we hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Take care.